The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time of year where I am stuck inside with the kids on February vacation. Someone's got to do it. And it looks like it's me. Meanwhile, Michael, I don't know where Michael went, but apparently he needed extra days for his vacation. Where where did Mike where did Michael go? I actually didn't listen when he said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the way Matt gets along with everybody. I'm going to Paris. That's all I know. Matt is in Paris as we speak. I mean, not as we speak, as you hear it. So what's what are you doing? Are you just getting just high and playing video games there? No, uh, I don't think I'll be able to do either of those things there. Uh, uh, I so would be willing to bet that you'll be able to do both, oh, well, frankly. We'll see. Check Matt out on Twitter. He's in Paris right now. <laughs> and, uh, it's Wednesday, so you've been there for what, three or four days? Yeah, actually, I'll just be about to come back. Wow. Well, oh, that's very nice. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're on vacation, yet we still provide for you brand new content. We've had an amazing week so far. Today, no difference. Sam Rosenfeld author of The Polarizers, post-war architects of our partisan era, uh, and fascinating uh, book uh, by a uh, very smart um, associate professor, assistant professor, um, and uh, it's interesting to get a perspective as to how we got here and there was a time where, you know, and look, I think um, uh, Rosenfeld says this. I certainly don't have a particular issue with our polarization. I don't. Um, broader process questions are not uh, I don't don't keep me up at night. Um, but it seems to me inevitable that. You're going to have polarization when you have differences of opinion uh, politically uh, the extent of the polarization and the grounds for it, though, sometimes are a little bit suspect. But I think you'll find it's very interesting. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. <clears throat> Matt will have one of his famous I'm in Paris picks for the fun half. Who knows what it'll be? Something Parisian, maybe. We don't know. But uh, fun half, folks, members. And I want to do thank our members. It is you that make this show possible. You can become a member today at jointhemajorityreport.com. Please do if you have the financial means. And if you don't, as always, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We will take care of you. We will not lock anybody out for financial reasons. All right, quick break. When we come back, Sam Rosenfeld. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Sam Rosenfeld. He's an assistant professor of political science at Colgate University and author of The Polarizers, Post-War Architects of Our Potter Partisan Era. Uh, Sam, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks so much. Glad to be here. Okay, so the um, your book uh, tracks, uh, I guess, our how we got to where we are today. And it, it starts in the, the post-war period where the problem at that time, and I'm not, uh, not necessarily saying that the problem today is polarization, but the, I guess the conventional wisdom or maybe the, 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 the conventional wisdom of the political science community was that there was not enough partisanship. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I would, you know, I would say it was a live debate, um, but that 
leading um, scholars of parties uh, and, and political science, as well as um, journalists and sympathetic um, political activists and politicians in the early post-war era sort of diagnosed as a crucial problem uh, in the American political system as it evolved a kind of, uh, you know, insufficient amount of polarization, <laughs> to use that term. And what, I mean, uh, what was the, uh, if that's the diagnosis, what was the, uh, I guess, the, the prognosis? I mean, or I, maybe vice versa. Um, what, was, what was the problem? Uh, what, what problems was uh, too much uh, bipartisanship causing at that time? Sure. So um, if you think back to this uh, era, you're talking about two um, major parties that were uh, quite internally, ideologically heterogeneous or divided internally. Uh, so you had within the uh, Democratic Party that since the New Deal had emerged as a kind of national, uh, the national center left party had this um, quite empowered uh, and quite increasingly conservative, uh, uh, dominated by Southern, but Southerners faction that was empowered in Congress, that was, um, you know, filled with uh, segregationist white supremacists. And a lot of a lot of those people were also kind of ideologically conservative on other issues. Uh, you had in the Republican Party, um, a, a kind of core of conservatives, uh, uh, but also particularly people who had who held kind of governorships in, in large uh, industrial states, you had a kind of a tradition of more moderate and liberal Republicans as well. Um, what these scholars and thinkers um, thought about a system that had parties like that is that, you know, even leaving substantive sort of policy aside, it posed a democratic, small d democratic problem to have two parties that were not providing voters distinct choices at the uh, during elections voters didn't have a strong sense as to like different directions the country would go into uh for voting for one um politician versus another and then on top of that uh the kind of rampant degree of bipartisan lawmaking that happened in in, in the system at that time meant that come re-election time voters didn't have any sense of any real sense of who to hold accountable for outcomes for the state of uh, the country, for policies that are passed, uh, because both sides were collaborating, collaborating so much uh, uh, in, in policy making, And you'd have basically ad hoc bipartisan coalitions um, sort of uh, collaborating on issue by issue. So it became very unclear, again, who you were holding accountable, where the lines of responsibility and public policy were. That was the kind of high-minded political science um, democratic theory critique. Uh, the other reality is, you know, a lot of these political scientists, not all of them, but many of them were themselves kind of liberal Democrats uh, uh, interested in um, seeing the promise of the New Deal and a kind of social democratic direction for national policy um, uh, thrive and continue. And they saw as a chief problem um, this kind of dissident faction within their their own associated political party that um, was empowered to kind of bottleneck um, progress and, and collaborate with the minority party to, to, to block things from happening. OK, so, I mean, what you've described there is one is a, a an intellectual movement, if you will, um, that was running in parallel with the desire of at least one party's activists. Let's stay right. with that. Um, well, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves at that point, but but what was if it was the case that you had Democrats who ranged from, I guess, um, very pro labor, uh, liberal uh, Democrats, northern Democrats, uh, industrial Democrats and conservative, at least in terms of aggressively in terms of race, it sounds like, and, and perhaps anti-union in the South. I mean, yes, uh, definitely. And then and then uh, in the Republican Party, you had uh, a similar um, maybe the numbers were slightly reversed, but a, a similar dynamic. What what was 
What held the parties together? Was it just simply tradition? My dad was a, a Democrat, so I'm going to be a Democrat, regardless of whether or not there is some type of ideological uh, sorting or what 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 was it that was was it just like, oh, I I ended up going to Pepsi instead of Coke because I was recruited out of college. Uh, you know. Right. I, I mean, is that basically what yeah, was going I mean, on? I mean, that's a great question. I, I think one of the answers is that the American um, political system, the constitutional structure, has always allowed for the parties to um, sustain much higher levels of internal diversity uh, than in other countries, particularly federalism um, and separation of powers, so that you could be affiliated with a party with a specific kind of constituency if you were a, a you know a, a, a local democrat in a big city and part of a machine um or a southern congressman who uh uh, uh would be voted uh, over and over again back in the office by constituents who would increasingly over the course of the 20th century vote for a republican for a president um all the kind of uh multifaceted fragmented uh, multiple levels of uh, the american government allowed for different people, uh, you know, ostensibly paying fealty to the same party to stand for different things to different voters at different times, which is something you don't see in other um, non-federal parliamentary systems, for example. But then also it is, you know, uh, the inheritance of party affiliations from history matters a lot. It was very sticky. Um, It was sticky on the level of who ordinary voters voted for. You know, my granddaddy was a Democrat. My daddy was a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. Um, That kind of inherited team or church-like affiliation that didn't really have much to do with um, policy issues or ideology. And, you know, if you could look back to the 19th century as a good example of a time when the party system was stronger than it's ever been. It, 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 uh, really defined political life and mobilized huge numbers of uh, voters in a, you know, a a pre-electronic age. Um, uh, And they were not most of the time at the national level ideologically defined at all. Um, What motivated uh, parties then were, was kind of the material incentives of, of patronage. That's what would motivate a lot of people to, be, to participate in politics. The policies that were being passed at the national level had more to do with just kind of distributing goodies to one party network or another rather than big ideological battles over redistribution or regulation. And, you know, through the 20th century, you have some of those motivations, particularly in the over time dwindling number of uh, urban political machines and, and rural political machines, for that matter, uh, that, again, organize party um, loyalties and activism, but were not preoccupied in any way by national issues or um, national ideologies. Men, you know, yeah, so go ahead. Well, no, I mean, is that, I mean, cause, uh, I mean, in, in around that time, I guess maybe uh, 20s, 30s, um you had a sort of a good governance uh, movement that that began to attack those the sort of um, entrenched uh, boss uh, political boss type of systems on a local level. But I think the other thing that that it, that occurs to me uh, is that as you move into the post-war period, the policies of the federal government become more important. Right. I mean, because we're following we're following the the New Deal and everything that is involved in that. We talk about sort of national housing policy. We talk about uh, we talk about a national health insurance policy. And we've just introduced a national, um, uh, you know, uh, retirement insurance policy. And so these issues become so coherence, ideological coherence becomes more important because uh, there is a, a a centralizing of policy apparatus so it's 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 that's it. good that is absolutely right that is exactly what uh these scholars were saying too a lot of whom you know had just came out of uh service in world war ii as as technical experts and advisors etc everyone got mobilized for for that experience um but uh the argument what you know as you point out the progressive era in the early uh, 20th century um, sort of ushered in a set of institutional attacks on those old 
uh, non-ideological um, uh, uh, patronage-based party organizations and other kinds of kind of technocratic reforms. But then it's the New Deal as a sort of revolution in American policy that that brings to the forefront for the first time a very activist, visible uh, national government and national policies that um, are going to now shape political battles uh, that only gets uh, aggravated even more as a result of uh, participation in the, the biggest, you know, global conflagration in world history, in which the United States emerges out of that as a, a global leader. Um, what these guys say is, politics at the national level is needs to be about national issues, and national issues are more important than they've ever been before. So, what we need are parties that can help to uh, shape national debates and um, competition over uh, the direction of national policy. And so you're going from uh, a political units, if you will, that are more transactional because they are more parochial to uh, political parties that are uh, ideological so that um, that policies can be implemented on a, on a on a broader scale. Exactly. And the what starts to happen, and, and commentators take note of this, is, uh, you know, over the long term of a decline in um, the old style political machines and the spread of mass education, um, you get a new kind of political activism. I mean, it's, it's not something new under the sun, but the rise to predominance of activism within parties by um, people who are motivated by issues or ideology. And they are typically, increasingly in the post-war era, motivated in, uh, and uh, interested in national level issues. Uh, some of the policies you just said, civil rights, health care, uh, labor law, etc. And in local and state parties in um, states all across the country, during the 1950s, uh, 40s and 50s, you start to see the emergence of uh, kind of internal party battles between old line party functionaries who um, aren't particularly interested in these ideological uh, uh, or issues at all, uh, and these new activists um, uh, seeking to reform their parties and, and ultimately take control over them. And that happens in both parties. Does it do, at that time? Does it happen more within the Democratic Party than the Republican Party? Because it seems to me that um, you're moving. You know, once we go, we go into the to the New Deal, right? There's a certain trajectory there, which is going to require the nationalization of politics more, and therefore the um, the ideologicalization. I don't think that's a word, but of 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 political parties and that it would make sense just based on their very nature that Democrats would be more aggressive in trying to push that, I guess, you know, uh, not just within the, 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 the form follows the function in terms of right. for, for Democrats more so than for Republicans. And yet we're also at a time then where there's there is seemingly and Kennedy, I guess, uh, says this in uh, during his presidency. We're not having an argument about outcomes. We're just having an argument about how to get there, more or less. I think I'm paraphrasing. But um, right. But it, it, and so those two things are in tension, in tension with each other or, or, or where where do those two concepts stand within each party and across party lines? Well, on the question of you know who's doing this when, um, I think it's definitely the case that it's uh, obviously the New Deal project is um, not just a partisan project, but it's, it is Roosevelt and uh, was a Democrat and his majorities were Democrats. Um, so, and precisely because what the advocates for um, what they call responsible party government, this idea of more disciplined um, and distinct and issue-driven um, parties at the national level, programmatic parties, they would call it. Uh, you know, what they had in mind was the Labor Party in Great Britain, which, you know, right after the war takes, runs 
an election in which they have a whole manifesto uh, laying out their plans to nationalize industries, uh, implement a universal health care system, et cetera, and they get elected and they are able to do all of that. Um, whereas, you know, Harry Truman's running into a bunch of trouble uh, trying to pursue a fair deal agenda uh, at the exact same time. What they wanted were kind of parliamentary style parties that at the national level could do more stuff. And that is a institutional, as you said, form follows function. That's an institutional uh, uh, critique and goal that is more amenable, I think, to big government activists, you know, right. people who want to use national power to do things. So you don't get so the political science critique of uh, the existing political system is, I think, resonates more with liberal activists, uh, democratic politicians, people like Hubert Humphrey, who meets with all the political scientists who are talking about this. He, he, was, he had a master's in political science himself. He gives speeches about it. Uh, I talk about a Democratic National Committee chair in the late 1950s, um, Paul Butler, who, you know, gives speeches explicitly kind of touting this and, and pursues reforms that um, were prescribed by some of these um, political scientists. Conservatives have it's a it's a different trajectory in which, you know, the institutional critique remains much more about protecting the prerogatives of Congress. And obviously, states rights becomes uh, uh, more and more of a, a catch all uh, when it comes not only to civil rights, but other kinds of, of national activism. And yet some of the same factional divisions and the dynamics of those divisions um, crop up. On the Democrat, on the Republican side, um, first you get battles bet uh, between uh, supporters of Robert Taft for president and the kind of activists aligned with uh, him against uh, uh, several uh, liberal to moderate uh, uh, presidential candidates uh, in a row, uh, culminating in Eisenhower. Then you get, on the one hand, the kind of intellectual. Um, uh, mission statements coming out of the conservative intellectual movement of William F. Buckley and the National Review, which uh, is emerging by the middle of the 1950s. And at the grassroots level, this same kind of predominantly middle class, well-educated, suburb increasingly suburban um, cohort of grassroots activists who um, are challenging existing state and local party organizations and who provide the kind of uh, backdrop for and, the, and the, the troops for the Goldwater insurgency that takes over the Republican Party in 1964, which is all about injecting stark, you know, uh, offering a choice rather than an echo, as, as um, Phyllis Schlafly uh, uh, put it, uh, campaigning for him. I mean, is that is that choice? Can that I mean, can, from from the Republicans' perspective at that in that era, and and I, I think I would argue that it's continued on. It's we've sort of lost sight sure. of this, uh, but I feel like that was it. Was there any more uh, explicitness to like, look, we are federalizing things too much? I mean, the irony is, is that right? Is that. Uh, the activists uh, on the Democratic side want to federalize things more. Um, and uh, one would think on the Republican side, you'd want that they, they want that less. And so the um, the the ideology is the ideological divide is is that is that primary divide right there. And it hasn't yet taken shape. Maybe it does with Goldwater, but it hasn't quite taken shape in the form of sort of the second order issues that follow. Does that make sense? Uh, so are you saying we're conservatives aware that trying to nationalize party debates would have the effect of empowering the national government in a, in a way yeah, they wouldn't like? Yeah, right. I mean, for, so for Democrats at that point, it seems to me the, the question is, is, like, what's the best way to, um, for the government to provide health care? And, right. um, and, and for Republicans at that stage, it's still like, no, that, the federal government should not be providing health care. I mean, how much? Right. And, and, and they weren't quite um, uh, there yet with sort of having to pretend that the second order question was relevant. That's... I would say, I mean, partly they, uh, you can't just get the degree to which both liberals and, and uh, conservatives 
had a belief that there was a electoral majority in the country that supported their position <laughs> and that American political institutions and the uh, interacting with the parties was were serving to um, kind of prevent or obscure or bottle up uh, this latent majority out there that would, from Democrats' perspective, champion the, the kind of continual expansion of uh, the American government into a robust social democracy. Or on the flip side, you know, what conservative activists, you know, what they were doing was trying to put together a national Republican coalition by going after uh, the South. And this is something, you know, people talk about Richard Nixon's um, Southern strategy, but for two decades before that, there are efforts to, whether it's a kind of a new party venture or uh, trying to find ways to kind of forge a, a formal alliance of, of Southern Democrats, have them switch uh, party affiliation in Congress to Republicans. There are all these efforts to try and um, achieve a kind of national conservative party that it could finally absorb formally the, the dissident conservative faction in the Democratic Party. So they're interested in nationalizing their party in that regard. But I, I, a lot of them, I don't think, made the connection between um, essentially nationalizing American parties and partisan conflict with necessarily um, ending up turning the national government into this activist state. I think they thought they'd have the political support to pursue uh, conservative ends so, in, with national power. So at what point does, I mean, it, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems at one point, and I don't know when it took place, whether it was in the 70s or prob maybe the probably the 80s, um, this flipped, it seems, that the, that the, 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 the push for polarization the the ballast seems to move from the Democrats to the Republicans. Is that is that accurate? And if so, when did that happen? I I think so. Yeah, I would say you know part of what I'm trying to do here because there's a there is a uh, I think a conventional wisdom in in scholarship that I agree with that uh, uh, what's called asymmetric polarization. Now, when we talk about polarization in the contemporary era, we are not talking about a equal both sides are moving to extremes or, or sort of pursuing the same tactics but instead if this is primarily a republican story um with a with sort of byproducts that we can look at and say it's polarization but it's being driven by that side um part of what i'm trying to do with this book is uh you know even uh, both point to and champion to a certain extent just to show my normative priors a little bit um the contributions that Democrats made to uh, reconstructing partisan and, and political institutions in ways that made them more um, permeable to issue-driven and ideological activism, which I don't think is a bad thing, uh, but that did have con contributions to long-run um, polarization. In the 1970s, you have a, it's a kind of free-for-all, <laughs> the parties, um, uh, become seem to become dis disintegrating before everybody's eyes all political scientists are mainly then talking about things like dealignment and the declining significance of parties the decline of american political parties um uh it's a time of huge institutional reforms you get the mcgovern fraser commission right. that leads to the rise of primaries you get congressional reforms that really topple the uh, power of these congressional committees and, and uh, the power of seniority in determining clout in Congress and instead empowers party leaderships. Uh, you have a the kind of second wave of potent grassroots conservative mobilization, particularly on the side of um, the kind of new right activists that are marrying economic conservative pro-business activism with these new cultural and social issues, bringing in the uh, religious right into the fold. And you get by the, it's definitely true if you look at, um, you know, measures of polarization uh, in voting behavior in Congress, et cetera. It's a story from the late 1970s onward of a continual push on the right to, um, 
uh, uh, both on the policy agenda and on sort of changing political institutions, making the party in Congress under Newt Gingrich especially ever more of a kind of um, aggressive, highly centralized um, partisan uh, machine, that you see that energy and those um, uh, that kind of push much more on the right than you do on a left that has kind of attempted to stitch together and more successfully, I think, than a lot of people give them credit for, a coalition that is a little bit less ideologically uh, cohesive um, than uh, the Republicans, but certainly way more ideologically cohesive than the Democratic Party used to be um, and are sort of in a defensive position for uh, the next several decades politically. I mean, is the uh, because I get, you know, uh, when we when we go th- as we go through the 70s and you talk about um, the the party reforms, like the process reforms and the sort of like the, uh, yeah. uh, the big D Democratic changes um, in um, in the way that the party runs itself. It, it, it seems like ideologically, you know, it's not. Ideologically speaking, there's not necessarily the big changes that take place through the 70s and the 80s. And, and, and to the extent that there are any ideological changes, it seems to me to move towards the center. And on the right, it's happening the opposite way. It is far more right. ideological and it is tracking much further away from the center. I mean, by the time we get to uh, Bill Clinton... Bill Clinton is sounding more like Reagan, right? I mean, whereas Reagan is actively attacking liberals and Democrats, Bill Clinton is at least agreeing, agreeing in some principle with Reagan that government, the big, the era of big government is over and whatnot, right? I mean, that's a tack right. to the right from where maybe Democrats were 20 years earlier, it seems to me, um, or 25 years earlier, um, and... So there's there's like a like a stag. If anything, there's a sta- there's a stagnation uh, in terms of like the ideological right. polarization from the center. I mean, as measured from the, the, the mean, I guess, of where the party was. Uh, and it's the opposite for the for the right. Um, well, here's where I, um, the, the kind of new Democratic factional push in the 80s and 90s is an important Development and one that, you know, pushes against uh, even the narrative I'm telling of, of polarization. What I would say, though, is, the, as you just mentioned, the mean kind of ideological degree of liberalism of your average Democrat is over those two decades not, in fact, going to the right. Um, and uh, sort of quantitative political science confirms that you get a rush to the right on uh, the Republican side, and certainly there are issues that um, emerge, often kind of bipartisan points of corrupt consensus, like around uh, financial reforms and, and deregulation in the 1990s that um, reflect um, not-so-liberal uh, ideological priors. But in general, the party, the base of the party, thanks in part to the activism of, of people in the 1970s, uh, remains a kind of cultural and economically liberal and increasingly uh, uh, ethnically diverse liberal base. You get at the elite level, and certainly uh, given his victory uh, in winning the nomination in 92, you get a kind of internal argument that is couched um, in terms of we keep losing the presidency, we need a course correction to try and win some national level elections. That's the kind of pitch that the DLC and New Democrats make, right. um, uh, as reflected in, in Bill Clinton, that, um, you know, uh, the, the points I make in the book is that even that argument and the, the, the policies that get produced uh, out of that tendency still stand, they are, they are not what the Southern Democrats and other dissident Democrats argued for in terms of a, 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 a political posture a few decades before, not just in terms of not being white supremacists, but they were still avowedly partisan 
And they were still policies that were framed and advocated as to the left of Republicans' policies. Um, and there was also, you know, it was a selective set of policy course corrections. It remained the case that the first big thing that Bill Clinton as president attempted to do was pass a universal health care bill. Um, uh, his record, I think, is mixed in its uh, ideological um, coloring, but uh, sort of compares from a liberal perspective favorably to, to Jimmy Carter's presidency. And in the long run, what I think you've seen in the aftermath of um, the Clinton years is a Democratic Party that still, I think, does not behave symmetrically in any way to uh, the Republican Party, but that has over the course of uh, the Bush, Obama and Trump years uh, continued to I, move left. And I would agree. I would agree. I would agree with that last part in terms of, of where we we have seen uh, Democrats move, particularly in the past 10 years um, mm-hmm. uh, to, to the left. Undoubtedly, it seems to me that the assessment of the Clinton years has to be one where, you know, it depends on what you're waiting uh, in your determination of right. what uh, going to the left means. I mean, and, and I would say even the same with Jimmy Carter, right, who uh, oversaw a lot of deregulation and, um, right. and, and demobilization of unions, uh, among other things. Um, and so it's it, it sort of let's leave that aside rather than try and sort of enter into those waters. Um, I think you sure. know, the bottom line is that um, clearly do, during those years, whether whether the Democrats tacked to the right, you know, of of where they were towards the mean, I guess, uh, or to the left, uh, they didn't they didn't move much relative to what was happening right. uh, uh, in the in the Republican Party. OK, so. With this, with, 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 is it possible to have a government that has become as federalized as ours has, and I would argue by necessity, but of course that's a function of my priors, um, is it possible to, to not have this type of polarization and... and Maybe I'm, you know, this is a too big of a of a, a thing to to chew on at the, simultaneously. But is there any way to tame? I mean, what what is the way? Because I, I for one, I'm perfectly happy with polarization. Um, right. Because I don't think good things happen in in the, particularly in this environment with bipartisanship because I, uh, of those who espouse it. Frankly, um, and, right. And there seems to be a growing awareness in the Democratic Party. It's it's been there in the Republican Party for some time, just from polling, that uh, polarization is necessary. There's less of a of a uh, an appetite for compromise in the Democratic mm-hmm. Party than there was even five years ago. Um, it, it, is polarization? I mean, is that is is it possible to have bipartisanship in this era when? There seems to be a lot more explicit understanding that, like, we don't share the same desired outcomes. I mean, that's the reality, right? Like, there is there is not a shared desired outcome here um, that is uh, cuts across both parties. Yeah, I uh, my answer is uh, no, (laughs) that you can't that understanding the basis of this era in the middle of the 20th century of unusual bipartisanship and depolarization, which colors a lot of um, people's experience, you know, uh, uh, journalists and, uh, and others of a certain age. This was the, the, the world in which they came of age. Um, understanding that the basis of that was this kind of like historically contingent mismatch of people's views about stuff and the ways the parties were organized uh, and the uh, over time increasing just importance of national level issues. You can't wind back uh, the clock or put the genie back in the bottle or like reconstruct political parties to not be organized around issues uh, uh, in the 21st century, it seems to me. Um, 
And it's, I do think it's precisely the kind of the sorting out of beliefs on substantive issues into these political parties uh, much more cleanly now that then kind of produces a bunch of feedback uh, dynamics that makes tribalism and hostility to the other side and um, uh, all of those dynamics that are kind of negative byproducts of it that make those very hard to to deal with. Um, uh, what I end up uh, saying, to the extent I can gin up any <laughs> solutions at the end of this book, um, is more you know that we have a political system that, as critics of the advocates of uh, more partisanship and disciplined parties, likes to point out in the middle of the 20th century, they were correct in saying that American political institutions, a, a system in which there's two different branches of uh, Congress. They're elected at different times, and you also have a president who can veto things. You've got a court that can overturn things. There are so many veto points and kind of places where uh, there are obstacles to uh, making policy in our system. Pl putting into that system two political parties that are ideologically disciplined and distinct uh, kind of parliamentary-style parties, and then giving them the ability to control different branches of the government at the same time, which happens a lot, not right now, but as of a year ago, um, is a recipe for real crisis and, and, and gridlock. And it, it, if anything, it encourages um, unreasonable and unrealistic demands because people know that the parties, particularly if they're in the opposition, know that they're not going to be held responsible for bad things that come out of that. Um, and so you've got a mismatch between how our parties work and how our political system is structured. And you can either hope to kind of change the parties somehow, or you can try and incrementally, ref you know, short of uh, having a constitutional convention and, and replacing it with a whole new system of government, you can try and incrementally change the political institutions to try and accommodate these parties. So do things like get rid of the filibuster, uh, which again was a, uh, uh, agenda item of responsible party advocates from the beginning, get rid of counter majoritarian um, tools uh, and institutions in the system so that parties, when they happen to have unified power, uh, have the ability to do what they want to do and can be cleanly held responsible for whatever those outcomes are. But that's obviously it's not a solution to polarization. That's, reshaping the government to accommodate polarization right and 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 okay and so uh, and and i i i uh, agree with that i think you and i think that's a very good point that people should keep in mind is that um you can't we can't have a functioning government we you know half of us may not like the way it's functioning uh but it will function i mean and the idea would be i think too in this era is to pare back the reliance on norms and make them, uh, you know, make them more, I guess, you know, the elimination of these norms are, are more sort of democratic in some way, right? Like what exists is going to have been agreed upon by everybody. Um, but it also... You're right, yeah. But, but it also seems to me that um, you have to lean into this polarization to get rid of the abuses from polarization, right? Because there has to be some measure of parity when we talk about the the negative impact of this polarization right because it seems to me that we have been living through an era where um because of the rate of polarization on the right or the 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 right. move away from the, the the mean uh they have been willing to discard norms at a at a, at a rate that is far greater than uh, the Democrats, the Democrats have started to get there a little bit, right? Like where they right. uh, where they got rid of the filibuster um, uh, under the last uh, term of, uh, of of Obama for for judicial picks yeah. and executive. Uh, they got th they, they started to get there. But it seems like you have to go further so that the absence of these norms, which protect the rights of the minority party, um impacts both parties equally right like they they we, i think 
you have to maintain some type of parity or the uh, negative effects of this impact one party more than the other. And there's no incentive to basically have a truce. I mean, I think that's right. I think, you know, I, I hesitate to opine on, I think there's good scholarship on, on norms as something that, you know, because I've seen people, uh, Julia Azari, a political scientist at Marquette, says she predicts that the effect of the Trump presidency is going to be useful. You're going to get some formalization of what had been norms about um, things that the executive branch can or can't do or con- conflict of interest rules, et cetera. Um, so formalizing some of that stuff, as you say, is, is democratic rather than relying on the good behavior of uh, kind of political elites. Um, that said, norms, I think, accompany any political system and are important. And <laughs> the erosion of them are, is, is both dangerous and difficult to, uh, to control. I, I do think it's, uh, I feel comfortable on a show like this, again, showing my priors to just say that I think there's a lot of people who say that they're upset with polarization but what they're upset with is the is the substantive agenda as well as the procedural behavior of the Republican Party. <laughs> and like I also object to the behavior of Republicans, um, you know, as a citizen. Um, uh, and it, it is a manifestation of polarization, but it's not the polarization that I'm worried about. It's the behavior itself. Right. Um, and that. Uh, all you you know, all you can do is push politicians and the kind of collective team uh, that of politicians and activists that uh, you whose agenda you believe in to um, act in as effective and tenacious and disciplined a manner to um, stop the things that you don't like happen from happening and and try and take power to do things that you like from happening and that will worsen, quote, polarization, but it will be necessary to save the country. <laughs> Sam Rosenfeld, the book is The Polarizers, Post-War Architects of Our Potters, a Partisan Era. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. This is excellent. Thanks so much.